The aims of treatment for amyloidosis are twofold. First is to achieve a reduction in the light chain protein to normal or as close to normal as possible. And secondly, for this to translate into improvement of symptoms and improvement of organ function. Treatments which are used for amyloidosis are typically drugs which are chemotherapy drugs used in combination to kill the abnormal cells in the bone marrow. Also for some patients who are fit and fulfill certain very strict criteria, we can use an autologous transplant or a stem cell transplant to achieve the same goal. We always use combinations of drugs because that allows us to use lower doses of individual agents and therefore they cause less side effects, less toxicity. But also because combining the drugs means that we can kill more cells more effectively and achieve these deeper, complete responses that we desire in amyloidosis, which will allow the organ functions to improve. Chemotherapy drugs um, have been used for treating amyloidosis for many years. These have been traditional chemotherapy drugs which damage the cellular DNA. These drugs are often not very easy to use and they can often have a lot of side effects and toxicities. Corticosteroids are normal hormones which are made by the adrenal glands in the body. But when these corticosteroids are used in very high doses, these steroids are quite lethal for the abnormal cells in the bone marrow. They complement the chemotherapy drugs or they complement the novel agents which we use for treatment of amyloidosis. Steroids are a very effective treatment, but they also have a number of side effects. Particularly in amyloidosis, the main side effect of corticosteroids are fluid retention. Over the last 10 or 15 years, we have had a number of new novel agents which are highly effective in killing the bone marrow plasma cells such as proteasome inhibitors like botazomib or immunomodulatory agents like thalidomide and its derivatives which are very effective, allow us to deliver treatment at a much lower toxicity and the treatment can then be delivered on an outpatient setting. The traditional side effects that we associated with chemotherapy like nausea, vomiting, hair loss, infection, low blood counts are often not seen with the novel agents or if they are seen, they are seen to a much lower degree. There are two main classes of novel agents. One is a group of drugs, so-called proteasome inhibitors. Proteasome is essentially a breakdown factory for the abnormal proteins in the cells. If one were to block this abnormal protein breakdown factory, the proteins will accumulate in the cells, and these accumulated proteins are incredibly toxic and will kill the cells. That's what botasome or Velcade essentially does. The main side effects of Velcade in patients with amyloidosis tend to be diarrhea or constipation. It can damage the nerves, particularly when many cycles are used, causing so-called neuropathy, which can typically manifest as pins and needles in feet, followed by pins and needles in hand. A peculiar problem in amyloidosis patients is low blood pressure and standing or postural hypotension, which needs to be monitored for. It can also affect bone marrow function and reduce the level of platelet cells in the bone marrow, but we will usually monitor for this when the chemotherapy treatment is delivered. The immunomodulatory drugs are the other class of novel agents. These drugs are called immunomodulatory because they not only kill the abnormal bone marrow cells, but they also help the immune system to fight the abnormal cells in the bone marrow. So they have a dual or more than dual mechanism of action. Thalidomide was the first of these drugs. And then because thalidomide was quite toxic to use and had a lot of side effects, newer drugs were developed, which is lenalidomide and pomalidomide. These drugs are used in amyloidosis, usually combined with steroids. The main side effect of the immunomodulatory drugs in amyloidosis is fluid retention. Patients often feel incredibly fatigued on these drugs, far more so than our myeloma patients reported. They can also cause increased risk of blood clots, particularly in patients who are leaking protein from the kidneys. And we often have to give blood thinners or anticoagulant like heparin or warfarin to stop this side effect from occurring. The key factors which tell us what treatment to decide is the end organ damage by amyloidosis. Patients who tend to have severe heart or kidney damage don't tolerate standard treatments too well. The age of the patient is a deciding factor. Older patients, we have to adjust the treatments and change the doses so that the patients will tolerate the treatment. We also often decide the treatment based on what is going on in the bone marrow. Patients who have low level abnormal cells in the bone marrow often can do with gentle treatments and shorter courses of treatments. The symptoms of the disease, such as patients who have nerve damage, we would prefer not to use drugs like thalidomide or botezomib because their side effect is nerve damage. The rapidity by which we want to achieve a treatment response also decides the combination of drugs we use and the intensity of treatments we use. So the treatment duration depends on two different things. One is how quickly the abnormal protein or the free light chains are coming down or being reduced. And secondly, how well the treatment is being tolerated. 
The third factor which impacts how long the treatment goes on for is what is going on within the bone marrow. So patients whose free light chains come down very quickly and who don't tolerate the treatment too well, we might only give two or three cycles of chemotherapy. Patients whose light chains are coming down slowly, maybe cycle by cycle, we would carry on the treatment till their light chains are down to normal, which may be between six and eight cycles. All the outcomes in amyloidosis are dependent on the light chains coming down to low levels, normal or near normal if possible. If the light chains reduce, everything else will improve afterwards. Alongside measuring the light chains, we'll measure markers for heart function, we'll measure markers for kidney function, we'll test the urine for leaking protein, and we may do scans. We may do scans of the heart, such as an echocardiogram or a cardiac MRI scan. And in the amyloidosis center, we'll do the SAP scan, which allows us to image amyloid in the internal organs like liver, spleen, and kidneys. The SAP scan is typically done at intervals between 6 to 12 months because the improvement on the SAP scan is a slow process whereas improvement in the light chains is a quick process and we can see the improvement literally within a month. We also assess symptoms and blood pressure which tells us how things are happening in terms of the cardiac function or the muscle symptoms or symptoms of fatigue which are a critical factor in how the treatment is working.